Thank you everyone for joining our webinar event for today. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Dato Muhammad Rafiq Merikan, the CEO for Maybank Islamic Berhad, as well as all the senior management of Maybank Islamic. Similarly, I would like to also welcome Associate Professor Dr. Gairu Zazmi Matgani, the Dean of the Kuliah of Economics and Management Sciences, International Islamic University, Malaysia, and all senior administrators of the faculty. On behalf of the organizers, it is my great honor to welcome each one of you, scholars, professors, industry players, practitioners, policy makers, researchers, as well as students to this webinar event, which is a collaborative effort between IIUM Center for Islamic Economics and Maybank Center of Excellence. My name is Muhammad Nizam bin Barum, and I am the coordinator of this program. And before we proceed with the webinar, please allow me to give a brief overview of this program. For your information, this webinar is part of a broader book review project awarded by the Maybank Islamic Berhad to IIUM Center for Islamic Economics. It is aimed to commemorate, revisit, as well as examine major contributions to contemporary Islamic economics by its uh, visionaries and prominent personalities. In our first webinar event, we have had a discussion and debate on the ideas and visions of Said Abul Ala Maududi in his publication, The First Principles of Islamic Economics. While Maududi's contribution has been more towards the foundational aspects of Islamic economics and finance, the webinar session for today will go into a bit more detail on the banking and monetary system as our figure for today is an IDB prize winner, Professor Dr. Muhammad Omar Chapra. And we will be looking at his visions, ideas, and propositions in his seminal work towards a just monetary system. I am very pleased uh, to uh, have with us three distinguished speakers, and we will shortly hear their comments and opinion on Chapra's proposition, as well as the contemporary relevance and practicalities of these visions in our current times. Before I pass the session to our moderator, Mr. Jamal Arif Jamaluddin from Maybank Islamic, I would like to wish all of you a good and fruitful discussion during the webinar. And we will be observing your comments and questions from the chat box. And, I, and, and I'm happy to say that Dr. Riasat Amin will be looking at your comments and uh, questions and will be forwarding them to Mr. Jamal Arif uh, during the question and answer session. Before we start with the webinar, I would like to record my sincere appreciation to the team members at the Center of Excellence uh, for Maybank Islamic, particularly uh, the coordinator, Encik Muhammad Raihan Abdullah, as well as Dr. Ramadan Fitri, Ustaz Muhammad, Ustaz Munawar, Ustaz Nick Azizu, and uh, Puan Rose. I would also like to express my sincere appreciation to the members of the review team on the part of IIUM Center for Islamic Economics, uh, namely Professor Muhammad Aslam Hanif, Dr. Mustafa Omar Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad Irwan Arifin, Dr. Muhammad Mahyudi Yusuf, Dr. Riasat Amin, as well as Sister Bushra Abu Said and Brother Firdaus. I wish you all the best in the webinar event and hope you gain a lot of knowledge 
and also practical solutions to our contemporary challenges in the area of Islamic banking and finance. Therefore, I pass the webinar event to our moderator, Mr. Jamal Arif Jamaluddin. Thank you, Dr. Nizam. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to Datuk Muhammad Rafiq Merikan, CEO of Maybank Group Islamic Banking, to Professor Dr. My apologies. To have Professor Dr. Garu Zazmi Margadi, Dean Kulia of, uh, of Economics and Management Sciences, International Islamic University of Malaysia, IIUM, to the Senior Management of Maybank Islamic, as well as to the esteemed faculty at IIUM. Finally, but not lastly, to all the attendees tuning in, tuning in today. We are excited to bring to you a scintillating discussion where we have three amazing speakers today to peel back the propounded ideas and concepts by Muhammad Umar Chapra in his book, Towards a Just Monetary System. Firstly, let me introduce you to Professor Dr. Muhammad Aslam Muhammad Hanif, who is currently attached to the Department of Economics at IIUM followed by Dr. Mustafa Omar Muhammad, who is presently an Associated Professor and the Director of the Center of Islamic Economics, KENMS, IIUM, where he has actually been teaching for the past 21 years. So we have a lot of wealth of experience joining us today. And finally, but not lastly, Professor Abdul Rahim Abdurrahman, who is currently the President of the International Council of Islamic Finance Educators. Moving on to our topic for today, before we jump into the conversation this afternoon, I would like to spare a moment to turn the audience's attention to a video on Muhammad Umar Chapra's long-standing career and also the contributions he has made in this space to set the context for today's panel session. Without further ado, could we kindly have the video? Please spare uh, a moment. Uh, we are just uh, momentarily getting the video up.
justice demands that the resources we have on earth should be used in equitably to ensure the well-being of all. you so we can see from the montage that muhammad umar chapra's contributions to contemporary islamic economics have been recognized not only by fellow muslim economists but also critics and commentators of the discipline his seminal works have been presented across the islamic and western world and we can draw a lot of wealth in terms of having a discussion uh with regards to the ideas and concepts that he's uh propounded so i'd like to lead into my first question and direct it to professor aslam from your perspective how do you see him in terms of his intellectual contributions to contemporary islamic economics bismillah rahman rahim um, thank you very much uh, sadr jamal um as you see from the montage just now omar chapra uh, you know belongs to a special group of scholars uh, we term him uh, to be one of the pioneers of islamic economics um, appearing uh, or you know in the period of the late 60s and 70s and even continuing uh, in the 80s and 90s and some of them alhamdulillah they are still contributing you know after 50 years of of uh, being in the in the discipline Uh, you know just by coincidence this morning i was uh, privileged to attend uh, the 50 year anniversary of the muslim youth movement of malaysia abib uh, they are celebrating 50 years and why i bring this up is because you know this event in malaysia coincides with a bigger event that happened 50 years ago and that is the beginning of what we may call the islamic resurgence globally and you had these pioneer islamic economists Omar Chapra being one of them um, you know who who represented a new breed of scholars uh, before him uh, or before these pioneers whenever you talked about islamic economics one would usually find um, you know the more traditional scholars people who came from fiqh background talking about um, you know the quran and the hadith and so on but what these pioneers did Um, is actually something that decided and 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 was uh, clearly trying to promote an application of the Islamic worldview to all aspects of life. And economics was was one of them. Yeah? And and Omar Chapra was in that group. They were calling for this idea of um, you know not blindly following the capitalist model or the socialist model, but to actually develop what. we call in the islamic economic system as an alternative and it is in that um, you know that uh, agenda that omar chapra uh, over the years uh, you know you've seen from the montage 15 books 90 articles so he was a very prolific writer um, and uh, you know his writings range um, comparative economic systems uh, social justice and and welfare Uh, Islamic banking and monetary economics, which I think we will be focusing a little bit more in this uh, webinar, and then later on he even looked at you know the future of economics uh, reforms that he thought were very important to be done, uh, as well as linking it to the Maqasid Ashariah and its relevance to reviving Islamic civilization. Yeah, so uh, I, I really think that you know Chapra, uh, as Khurshid Ahmad in the forward of this book, uh, rightly you know puts Chapra as um somebody who you know who was at the at the beginning of a more analytical phase of islamic economics of course some of us here may um, you know may may think that um uh, the analysis done uh, was not as advanced as what we have today but you have to put them in the context this is the 19 late 1970s mid 80s and so what they did was actually a very very Um, you know, a big leap forward for Islamic uh, economics. Thank you, and I have to concur with you on that. The shift towards more analytical approach, I guess, also drew the attention of the Western contemporaries as well, as they can also relate better and perhaps even see the light in terms of the concepts and ideas that was put forward by uh, Umar Chapra. Um, and to that note. Um, I would like to also echo that as you mentioned the ideas were quite broad in concept. So with regards to that, uh 
how do you think in terms of the influence of them said ideas and works in terms of its impact towards the works of his contemporaries and the later generation of Muslim economists? Thank you. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I consider Omar Chapra to be in this group of pioneer Islamic economists. And these pioneer Islamic economists, um, I think they were path breakers. You know, if I can give an analogy, it's like, you know, these are the, the pioneer seafarers that, that, you know, went on the seas and opened up new territories. Yeah? They found new territories all over. And, and this is how I look at people like Chapra, uh, you know, who, who, uh, who were really starting from scratch. You know, they, they did not have, as we have today, um, a 50-year tradition of Islamic economic writings to look at. They were the path breakers, right? And what they were talking about was holistic reform agenda. Uh, so Islamic banking had to be part of an Islamic economic, social, and moral order, right? Um, and uh, those who promoted uh, what we call now the Islamization of knowledge agenda, uh, they would say that this is a civilizational agenda. Yeah, so you, you really had a, a group of people who were looking at a much more comprehensive view and not just talking about introducing Islamic banking. The elimination of riba, of course, which is a very fundamental tenet in Islam, uh, was only part of that Islamic economic reform agenda. Right? Mm -hmm. And what was so interesting about Chapra's uh, uh, views is that, uh, and, in, and it's stated in this book, uh, writing in 1980s, uh, Muslim countries were considered by Chapra to be at a very you know, young stage in their development. And therefore, he argues that this is the time that Muslim countries could actually adapt and adopt an alternative system. So we could, we could start fresh, with this new system that would benefit you know, the Ummah as a whole. Um, and besides talking about banking and finance, you can, you can see a lot of ideas in this book, although he may, maybe he elaborated on them in other places. He talked about SME development. He was not in favor of big businesses. He was talking about SME development. Uh, he was talking about the big role for the state effective monetary, fiscal, and even incomes policy. We don't discuss income policies uh, you know, today a lot, but he talked about this. And even direct control measures. Uh, today, we see it in COVID-19, you know, how people are talking about the need to control uh, prices of you know, food items, etc. So he was talking about the possibility of even wage um, uh, policies and, and price controls. Uh, you know, and, and in this book, specifically to contain the erosion of the real value of money. I think that's a very important point, uh, you know, to, to keep in this part of the book. So really, uh, you know, in, in, in a kind of a concluding point to this round, um, Chapra was a, you know, was a, was a very big, um, um, you know, contributor. Unfortunately, the ideas that he and pioneers like him promoted may have taken a, a kind of a decline, you know, with the advent of Islamic banking, focus turned to Islamic banking in practice, mm. all right? And as academic, I would think that, you know, this was a sad thing that these ideas were, were, were kind of marginalized for some time. Um, but you see in the last 10, 15 years, again, an interest in going back to this, you know, to these pioneers and their ideas and, and how they, they talk about this holistic uh, agenda. And, you know, I, I have to say, uh, in addition to Dr. Nizam, uh, we really thank, uh, you know, uh, uh, Maybank Islamic for, for taking up this project yeah, to, to enable us to relook at some of these pioneering ideas so that as we move forward, as we face the challenges of this, you know, trying times, we can actually put forward a more holistic agenda, which is what uh, Chapra and all the other pioneers uh, were, were calling for. So maybe that may be my opening few remarks. Maybe others would have some other uh, comments to make. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think, alhamdulillah, um, you're rightly uh, to point out that the relevance and, and also the, the current timeliness of coming back to these ideas and concepts is very timely with regards to the current um, 
background uh, as well as landscape that, that we are facing during the pandemic. And we can clearly see there's some dislocations in terms of the real economy, financial economy, uh, which has clearly impacted uh, livelihoods um, across different demographies uh, and social classes as well. So this brings us to the book in itself, where it does already mention this all those years ago. It is uh, in the introduction section of the book, where it says that the widespread poverty, inequality and injustice caused by interest-based monetary systems and the capitalistic economic system has motivated Chapra to conceptualize and propose an alternative system based on the Islamic teachings, which is a bit more holistic and also promotes the socio-economic justice. This provides the realization of overall human well-being and upholds the mentioned socio-economic justice. So I'd like to just uh, give a moment to Dr. Mustafa. Maybe he can further elaborate on what Chapra envisage in this concept in terms of the justice, particularly in banking and monetary systems. Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Um, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Um, our dear viewers uh, who are following online on this program, I say assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to everybody. And I would also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Dr. Muhammad Rafiq, American, the CEO of uh, Maybank Islamic, and of course, the presence of uh, our Dean of College of Economics and Management Sciences, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Gairo Zazmi uh, my colleagues who are sharing me in the panels, and uh, don't forget uh, Dr. Nizam and uh, Brother Encha Raihan, who have been very active in the program. Uh, and also, I would like to thank uh, the moderator, uh, Brother Jamal. I think it's a good question. Um, really, when you look at uh, statistics, uh, whether you're talking about the World Bank, uh, you're talking about UNDP, uh, it's not a hidden secret that uh, the rate of poverty has really increased in equitable distribution. For example, more than 70% of world community are actually living under poverty and the wealth is controlled. Uh, more than 80% by less than you know 20% or 15% of the world population. And people talking about the 1% uh, in America. So uh, the work by Chapra, and if I may, you know, to follow what Prof. Aslam says, putting in context, you know, looking at this situation then in the 80s, when it has not really evolved to what we see today, I think is something um, that we give credit uh, to him to look at the, the main theme of social economic justice. Um, which is something which I think will continue uh, to be the concerns of uh, many uh, societies, whether they are conventional scholars or Muslim scholars. I think uh, this is a concern of everybody. Now, in his second chapter of the book, um, Chapra uh, looked at uh, social justice as a way of life itself in an Islamic economic system. It's not something in the periphery. It's where Muslims should take it as a way of life. Uh, how people will share their resources, the rich sacrificing part of their resources for the poor, uh, ensuring that the institutions are in place uh, to, to, to achieve that uh, equitable distribution of income and wealth. On the other hand, he also argues that Islam uh, tries to argue against or eliminates all forms of exploitation in business transactions, whether such uh, exploitation is in the form of corruption, in the form of uh, fraud, uh, in the form of profiteering. Uh, so those are, are very essential to social economic justice. And therefore his focus on that chapter was on riba, uh, riba or interest. Although interest is part of riba itself, and he clearly mentioned the word riba, so he argued on the basis of two kinds of riba, which is riba nasia and riba al which I think has a lot of implications to our banking system. Uh, because according to him, as also argued by other scholars, uh, riba and nasia basically is when you predetermine uh, the returns uh, of, uh, uh, of the loan 
and then not only predetermine, but you also have a positive return, which you predetermine early uh, on the loan. And then the amount varies according to time, whether this amount is fixed or variable. Mm -hmm. uh, but just let me put in context here, because it might not have been discussed in the book. Um, there is this word in Arabic called a dain. Uh, a dain is that. So in the, in the Sharia, that is classified either as qarb, loan, money loan, or a debt can be created from sale, uh, from sale. And so I think what uh, Chapra is referring to is debt in that monetary debt, uh, which is the qarb, uh, the qarb. Uh, because when you have created a debt from sale, then the issue of you know, charging more, et cetera, does not, does not arise. So if we focus on this qarb, he says, this is what is happening today. And, uh, and whether you call it by any name, still it is uh, considered riba. Call it uh, service charge, call it any kind of charge. So long as those features of uh, predetermined returns are there, and it's a positive return, and it is for a waiting period of the law, still it's considered riba. And interestingly, you look at the other side of riba al fadl uh, unlike where we have many scholars will talk about uh, focusing on the six items mentioned, uh, gold for gold, silver, and the rest. But Chapra looked at it as a form of, you know, ribal fadli is unjustified exchange uh, in business transactions, which I like it. And in fact, it conforms to the hadith of the Prophet, which he mentioned in his appendix. Uh, where the Prophet وسلم, says, if the two kinds differ, sell the way you like. Meaning that the idea is not about exchanging the items, whether gold for gold, silver for silver. Uh, because in practice, nobody has ever recorded. And if you ask even among all the audience, have you ever gone to another person and say, I give you 200 ringgit, please give me back 200 ringgit. This never happens in real life. Uh, it doesn't happen. So in other words, the Prophet ﷺ was not intending that everybody should go and give one 200 and Jamal give me back 200, no. The idea is that there should be a kind of transactions, uh, cash transactions, uh, exchanges in the market, and which rightly Chapra pointed out that once this exchange has an unjustified means, then definitely it, it constitutes to, uh, to riba. Now, what are some of the implications we have today since his discussion on this uh, focus on riba until today. Uh, I think there has been a lot of challenges in the banking system as far as riba is concerned. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we face today is the pricing of our uh, assets or products in the Islamic banking system. We still rely heavily on the interest rate benchmark. And this is still a, a point of debate. And if you look at the components of this benchmark, there are a lot of issues. Uh, the so-called future values, present value, uh, and you look at the variations uh, of this uh, pricing based on time. And I think this is uh, something that I think scholars have to look at. Huh? And this is where I think uh, we can connect the relevance of what Chapra has said. But overall, I think uh, his message, his focus on the idea that social justice is the way of life, I think is a very interesting statement, which will really prevail uh, from time uh, to come in the future. Uh, so if some of my colleagues have some addition to make, uh, I would welcome. Jazakumullah khair. Salaam alaikum. Dr. Jamal, can I intervene? Just it's an addition. Yes, yes so, sure. I really like the way that Dr. Mustafa talked about riba. And from what he said, I, I just want to relate it to the literature that has come out in the last 50 years. Yeah, You know, besides the banking and financial sector where riba is seen as interest or maybe in a very small uh, group of people usury yeah, they make a distinction between usury and interest but besides usury and interest i think what was interesting in what was mentioned just now is that you know chapra in his writings also uh, talks about the two other meanings that that maybe has not been give, given enough attention and that is riba as unearned gain, yeah, getting something without earning it. And secondly, riba as exploitation. I think when we talk about economics and economic reform, um, you know, to limit riba just to looking at interest rates, 
I think sometimes may, 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 may fall short with what we want to do because, you know, an interest-free economy may not be a riba-free economy, right? What we want is to eliminate the riba. So we need to understand, I think, riba and its implications in a much wider, wider way. So just in addition, thank you very much. Thank you uh, to both Dr. Mustafa and Professor Aslam. I think you both made quite good points and it kind of aligns uh, or alludes to our following question. So now that we've already scrutinized uh, in terms of the interest uh, or debt-based uh, financing or financial system, we also have to ponder about uh, the transition to where or the next phase. Uh, so Chapa has also uh, put together his thoughts on this. He envisaged moving away from interest-based debt-based system and argued for an equity-based uh, banking or financing, financing model. So I'd like to give an opportunity to uh, Professor Rahim, if you could kindly uh, elaborate for our benefit in terms of Chapra's thoughts on the merits of an equity-based model and how would this be able to solve the predicaments of our Muslim societies today, like mentioned by Dr. Mustafa. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, Dr. Jamal. Uh, thank you also to Maybank Islamic and Center of Islamic Economics of International Islamic University to Dr. Rafiq, Dr. Rafiq, uh, CEO of Maybank Islamic, and also Dr. Gairu Azmi, Dean of Kulia of Economics and Management Sciences, IIUM, um, and all participants. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Alhamdulillah, this Friday, very nice day. Very good day for the Muslims. We are doing uh, a soul searching, basically. Uh, a book review is actually uh, Satu Majlis Ilmu. It's actually where we hope we gain certain insights uh, from the the the, the uh, important book as what we are supposed to discuss this afternoon this afternoon entitled towards suggest monetary system written by a very well known economist uh, Muhammad Umar Chapra now um, the question is that uh, what are actually Chapra's thoughts on the merits of an equity based model eh? um, if we read carefully the book we will realize that uh, Chapra's approach towards economic reform is a very multifaceted uh, perspective, but he focused very much on the human dimension of economic reform. That's number one. Now, if you refer to basically the first chapter, second chapter, you will realize that uh, Omar Chapra uh, focus is not just to reform the banking and financial system. It's actually a, the whole economic system. Now, he focused on individuals. Uh, he mentioned uh, there's no spiritual reform, no economic reform can be meaningful unless we focus or we penetrate the economic system and we remove all sorts of injustice, exploitation, and also economic instability. I think Dr. Mustafa did mention about economic justice just now. That will become, or social justice, that will become the underlying theory of uh, reform as proposed by uh, Omar Chapra. And he, he even mentioned further that the system uh, should be reformed to address the excesses, the imbalances, the injustice, uh, the, riba, the, the, the injustice of the riba system. And we have to promote equality in the society. So in that sense, his approach is very much human, very much societal approach, try to address the problem as comprehensive as possible. Now, if we look at the uh, alternative model that he proposed, which is the equity-based financing, as we know, um, two most prominent uh, equity-based financing is actually Mudarabah and Musharaka. One is profit sharing, Mudarabah, and another one is Musharaka, profit and loss sharing. Now, if you look at the theory, the underlying theory, uh, the role of Mudarabah and Musharaka is to mobilize funds, but at the same time, to develop entrepreneurship. This is where both financiers as well as entrepreneurs share ownership, share control, take equal risk of a business. And this is actually based on the Sunnah of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, engaged in Mubarabah during his time. And this is actually pre-Islamic, pre-revelation. And it was accepted later by Islam uh, based on the social justice of Mubarabah and Musharaka. What is actually Mubarabah and Musharaka in simple terms? It is a form of uh, equity financing, whereby it is uh, profit sharing in the case of Mubarabah to encourage risk sharing, to encourage joint efforts in the, in the project, and to build entrepreneurial skills. 
one party contribute capital, the other party provide uh, works as what we, we understand the case of Mudaraba. Musharaka, joint partnership, profit and loss sharing. The underlying reason here, if you look at the theory, is actually risk sharing, joint efforts, and building entrepreneurial skill is the essence of economic transformation that Chapra has tried to put forward. And his proposition uh, was actually very clear if you look at uh, the distinction or the differences between debt versus equity. Uh, equity financing is more asset-based. It's more uh, real economy activity. Uh, each party take equal responsibility, take liability equally, take the risk, uh, risk sharing and liability sharing, direct participation contribution by the parties involved. Compared to debt, it's basically very much a lending activity. Of course, in Islamic sense, we have a non-profit lending, but with fixed return, um, no matter what the outcome of the business venture. So the economic reform that he envisaged is actually more of societal reform, uh, social justice and economic uh, injust, uh, justice, and to get rid of income and wealth inequalities by virtue of the practice of riba and so on. Now, um, but of course, we know there are so many challenges uh, to, to establish social justice. Going back to your, your, your second question, uh, to really ensure social justice in society is very challenging. And if we take the, the case of equity-based financing, Islamic banks in many Muslim countries are established based on commercial banks. And if you read uh, chapter six of his book, he mentioned that Islamic banking should be universal bank in order to be able to implement equity-based financing effectively. So by nature of commercial bank, they are risk averse. They want to protect in depositors' funds as, uh, as, as, as stringent as possible. And uh, therefore, they prefer less risky, more debt-based financing, such as Rabaha, Tawaru, and so on. It become more attractive in terms of risk man uh, management. However, of course, uh, equity-based financing, in addition to that, exposes also moral hazard which has been uh, discussed by many scholars, eh? in the fact that why Mudaraba and Musharaka is very negligible in many uh, Islamic or Muslim societies is because of the element of moral hazard, how to manage uh, the cost of evaluation, cost mon monitoring costs, regulatory costs, and so on. And to make it worse, we have international <laughs> bodies such as Basel uh, Committee or Basel Accord that put additional capital requirements for Islamic banks to offer equity financing. So, Again, unfortunately, even IFSB, Islamic Financial Services Board, followed the same, same route. So as a result, that's what we see today, though the initial idea in 1980s by Omar Chapra, but in real practice, in reality, uh, there's very little uh, equity, Islamic equity financing due to uh, what I mentioned earlier, risk averse uh, commercial banks, uh, moral hazard issue, as well as uh, prudential regulatory requirement at international level. Now, um, in chapter four uh, of Chapra's book, he mentioned about gradual transformation. I think this is very important to highlight because when, when he said about transformation, he didn't say immediate or uh, urgent transformation. It's more of gradual transformation. He mentioned about the importance of uh, the government to, tight, to tighten up regulation on tax evasion. He mentioned about uh, tax structure should, be, should encourage investment. He mentioned also the need to form to, to the formation of uh, financial institutions, investment banks that encourage venture capital firms to invest in business. So these are the preconditions that uh, Chapra mentioned. And as I mentioned earlier, he also mentioned that Islamic Bank should be a universal bank that do both uh, commercial as well as investment activities. But again, this proposition by Chapra, underlying theory is very strong, very sound, deep uh, from the practice of the Sunnah of the Prophet, try to address moral justice, but uh, social justice and economic justice, but there are certain shortcomings in reality which we need to address. But over the years, over the years, um, moving forward, I believe there will be gradual transformation also in many Muslim societies uh, to pay attention again to the, pre the fundamental reform, economic reform, which we should focus on the human dimension uh, and social justice as proposed by Chapra. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, sorry, uh, to all attendees, please ensure your mics are, are on mute um, as to not interrupt the session. And just building on, on what you said, Professor, um, would there be anything else uh, that uh, Professor Aslam or Dr. Mustafa, if you want to weigh in on what uh, the points he mentioned? 
before we move on to, to the next question, which I'm quite excited to bring forward as well. Okay, Mustafa, anything you have to add? Yeah, I think uh, most of the thing which um, <coughs> has already been said by uh, Prof Rahim, and uh, I like the idea about uh, bridging the gap between uh, the theory and, and practice and the way he puts it very nicely. Uh, how uh, right from the basis of the Quran and Sunnah, the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, how again this idea was articulated by Chakra. And then uh, we have to see how these ideas are translated into practice uh, that uh, conforms to our uh, banking sector. And I like the idea which also he mentioned about the universal banking, which also cuts across uh, his um, idea of uh, institutional reforms. Uh, where he says uh, Islamic banking uh, should not be commercial banks, but Islamic banks uh, should be universal banking. And an idea which I'm sure many of you un understand, uh, which is being practiced in European countries due to liberalization and conglomerates of uh, uh, bringing together many of the institutions, for example, uh, banks merging with insurance companies and others merging with uh, uh, fund management, uh, uh, also, we have in Malaysia, uh, there are also banks that have fund management. They also have some minimal offering of securities. So I think uh, typically the direction may be uh, towards that uh, universal banking. Thank you. Yeah, if I just add a little bit on, yeah, uh, I think one of the points that, uh, that Chapra mentions in his book, um, and keep in mind this is something that he talks about in 1985 and maybe even earlier, uh, and this is about the entire credit creation process of the banking system. Yeah? And I think this is an issue that, that many, many uh, scholars have also addressed. Um, but Chapra certainly is one of the early ones in the, in the early 80s to be talking about this. And basically, his idea is it's the depositors like you and me who put money in banks. And banks basically through the credit, you know, the, the giving out of loans in the conventional system, they create money. And, and therefore, uh, Chapra argues in the, in the book, it's a very interesting point, that in addition to the return that is given, so if it's conventional banks, you give interest, you know, on your deposit. Uh, and if it's an Islamic bank, you, you know, you may give a profit rate or something like that. But he argues that in addition to that, there should be some kind of profit sharing between the depositors in the banks. I, I think this is a, is a fascinating idea, you know, but I have to say, despite using this book in the mid-80s in IAUM, you know, um, I, I forgot about this, this argument that was made in the mid-80s, um, telling that, you know, in the, in the name of justice, there was a need to distribute the profits, you know, so that more people uh, would, would benefit from that creation of, of money. Uh, he wasn't talking about uh, no fiat money or, you know, that, that you should have a 100% reserve requirement. He was saying, okay, it's there. You are creating money in the system, but why don't you share it with all parties? And so that's an interesting idea to me. And the second point, which he, he talks about also in his book is that banks, um, you know, basically, if you don't have asset, you, you are not going to benefit from the banking system. Right, so so he was talking about the need, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Rahim, the need for other institutions, I think, to to come into the picture. Uh, and I think the last 15, 20 years, we have seen other institutions now becoming also important in that, you know, in the spectrum of institutions that we have uh, in Islamic uh, financial system as well as in the economic system. So I think you know things are moving in the right direction, um, you know. Uh, and, and we hope that, um, you know, in, in addressing some of the current needs that we have today, we will be able to actually bring forth this, you know, all the different institutions that we can have, uh, rather than just only focusing on a particular kind of banking. I think that that is a big message that, that Omar Chopra tries to bring in his book. Allahu Akbar.
Thank you, Professor Aslam and Dr. Mustafa. I think both of you uh, tied in with the points made by Professor Rahim quite well. And I think the, one of the main overarching themes uh, is that bridging, right? That bridging between theory and practice and realizing that uh, despite uh, the current situations and the current economics, uh, sorry, the the current infrastructure of the underlying system that we should make efforts towards realizing uh, what was mentioned by Uma Chapra. However, to that note, it, the interesting uh, point I would like to circle back and, and pose the question to Professor Rahim is conversely of the shortcomings and the challenges as, as the three of you have mentioned, the industry has been growing at a tremendous rate for the past several decades. There is a proliferation and perhaps it's on a phasing approach. Uh, maybe you can add on uh, to the, in your answer. But if I could just go to my question in terms of, Professor Rahim, what is your appraisal in terms of the current state of the industry in relation to the objective of realizing the socioeconomic justice on top of uh, fulfilling its fiduciary duties? Thank you. Um if uh, I may answer your question in a slightly different way. Um, banks by nature, as I said, uh, very prudent, highly regulated industry and uh, subject of course scrutiny uh, so that they serve public interest, uh, especially uh, among depositors and customers. So taking that into perspective, uh, Islamic Bank is actually no exception. Uh, they have first to make sure that uh, uh, regulators are happy, regulators who gave license to, for Islamic banks to operate. And uh, Islamic banks should also be, should, is also, they are also expected to fulfill their responsibility to all depositors and shareholders. Uh, in addition to, of course, our expectation uh, from the Islamic economics reform point of view is actually to ensure Islamic banks also to contribute towards economic and social justice. So we have very high expectation on Islamic banks, more than our expectations on conventional banks. So very unfortunate uh, for Islamic banks to subject to, uh, in addition to Islamic banks need to be stable, they cannot remain uh, small so that they will survive the competition. In addition to that, they have to be stable. They need to ensure they have to safeguard the needs of depositors and shareholders. They are being monitored by central banks, and in fact, more vigilant than other banks. Other banks, they are not so worried about uh, Sharia compliance. Islamic bank, they have to comply with Sharia. There is an additional requirement set by Islamic bank, by, uh, by central bank to uh, all Islamic banks. So uh, the, the common challenges for any banks, Islamic banks included, is the bank must be stable. Stability is so crucial to ensure depositors are taken care of. They need to be sustainable. Making profit is important, but making a stable profit, sustainable uh, contribution to society as well is also as important. And they have to have high integrity. Now, uh, Central Bank of Malaysia even uh, produce, introduced uh, value-based intimidation uh, policy paper as well um, for Islamic financial institutions, for Islamic banks. So it becomes very uh, challenging for Islamic banks basically to survive. But um, Brother Jama, I would like to uh, link to the five challenges uh, raised by um, uh, Umar Chapra in his later books, uh, The Future of Economics and Islamic Perspective. It was written in 2000. I have a series of Umar Chapra's book. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, the book on just monetary system. I, I lost it. I bought it many years ago when I was uh, a student in UK in 1980s, late 1980s. So uh, I tried to look for it, I couldn't get, but anyway, I, get, I managed to get uh, the later version of it. Uh, but when I referred to the book written by him later on, 15 years later in 2000, uh, maybe through his reflection over 15 years, he mentioned a couple of things which we need to be uh, reflected here today as well, uh, to be fair to his thoughts over many years. Eh? He mentioned one thing, um, standardization of product, Islamic financial product is not desirable. Uh, because Sharia itself allows a great deal of leeways. Though we prefer uh, Islamic equity financing, but he also mentioned that standardization, regimentation would hurt innovation. But in addition to that, he still prefer, <laughs> he still prefer um, Islamic equity financing. And he proposed that there must be minimum degree of standardization 
to ensure smooth operation of the financial market. And he also proposed that the key issues, the debates among the scholars should also be resolved and minimized. And the, the role of central bank uh, to him is very critical, very crucial to ensure they play a positive leadership role to really uh, grow the Islamic bank. And he also mentioned that, um, uh, like what I mentioned just now, many Islamic banks are very small compared to mega banks, uh, okay, mega banks, conventional banks that we have today. Then as a result, many Islamic banks have, uh, they are unable to reap economies of scale. They are unable to adequately diversify their portfolios that became more challenging to Islamic bank. And uh, the Prasla mentioned, uh, in his book, he also mentioned about the need for many other supporting institutions like credit rating, uh, corporate uh, development of entrepreneurship training, and so on and so forth. So to ensure that Islamic equity financing will, will really be uh, practiced uh, in, in the industry. But, but unless, until unless we have all these uh, supporting institutions, it's quite difficult. And uh, central bank, the monetary authority, or, or, or the, the, the regulators of Islamic bank must also take this into consideration. We need to be fair to Islamic banks, but at the same time, we want Islamic banks to really contribute to social economic justice. That is the pre uh, prerequisites or the main reason why it was established in the first place. Not just to get rid of as Prof. Islam mentioned, to get rid of any form of inequalities and uh, uh, discrepancies. So in that sense, I just uh, raised one issue about depositors just now, as I mentioned about depositors. He mentioned in his later books that depositors, uh, Islamic bank or the, uh, depositors should not be treated like conventional bank depositors. They should have the voice in the bank management uh, because they also participate in the risk. That is basically in the case of Mudaraba deposits. But in our case, of course, we transform our deposit in such a way that is very much similar to conventional deposits. And he mentioned also one thing, the, the area which I'm very keen and very interested as well. He said very clearly over the last 15, 20 years, lack of uniformity in the accounting and auditing practices of Islamic banks. Even um, after the establishment of AUFI in 1990s, up until now, it takes time for Islamic banks to converge in terms of their practices, including accounting practices. It takes time to accept. It takes time to implement disclosure requirements that are uh, more uh, equitable or more user-friendly, uh, as, as I may say. So in that sense, uh, as I said, they're more challenging. Last but not least, I just need to mention um, Bank Negara Malaysia uh, introduced policy document on value-based intimidation. If you ask me personally, uh, instead of moving towards uh, CSR, in terms of uh, moving towards environmental uh, reporting and so on and so forth, to me, value-based intimidation must be must be built based on equity-based financing, mudarabah and musharaka. We don't expect 100% uh, financing should be based on mudarabah and musharaka, but uh, it's a more balanced approach in instead of too much mudarabah. Uh, we should uh, now, I think, in the, in the spirit of uh, value-based intimidation, in the spirit of uh, protecting uh, prosperity, protecting people, this is time, actually, we, 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 we ensure also the process of equitable uh, mode of financing to be practiced to ensure justice is done and to, to facilitate entrepreneurs to grow instead of just uh, lending money. Okay, in that sense, um, that is my response to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rahim. I think you struck uh, quite a chord in terms of um, it is beyond just uh, the Islamic convention uh, sorry the islamic commercial bank uh, institution but it is an ecosystem uh, if i can get your point right so there are more than one critical component towards realizing this transformation and it is um, uh, hinged on each success of in embedding and enacting the different uh, support roles that it can be a viable system because if not uh, it would probably uh, not have the uh, uh, the stability to to carry out its rules so i think uh, interestingly umar chapra alluded this uh, in his book as well so he did talk about the critical components of a successful transformation towards a just banking and monetary system which has been uh, quite detailed uh, in his uh, book that, that I just mentioned. So 
I would like to put the question to Dr. Mustafa, if you can um, share with us your views on how to create this enabling and supportive institution in the context of the current time and conditions. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, thanks again, uh, Brother Jamal. And, and I think uh, uh, Prof. Rahim has uh, discussed some of those uh, <clears throat> uh, transformation uh, already. Um, uh, if you look at uh, what uh, Chapra had envisaged earlier, um, uh, and there were two assumptions that he was making throughout. One is the idea that, uh, rather three, uh, the issue of social economic justice, and uh, the idea that in the banking system, the riba, riba would be eliminated in those assumptions. And then the, and of course by riba, just like what Professor explained in, in that broad sense, uh, not in a narrow sense. So the third one is uh, the idea of uh, equity uh, oriented financing. Uh, you're talking about shirka, mudaraba, uh, and all this kind of financing. And throughout even the reforms has been within this context, all the transformation he has been spelling out uh, has to deal with these um, areas, uh, these three areas. Now, he discussed about, uh, you know, making reforms in six kinds of institutions. Because of time constraint, I'll be focusing on some few important ones. So, this, so those six uh, reforms should be done on the central bank, uh, the commercial banks, the non-banking financial institutions, and then there should be also specialized credit institution to cater for uh, those small guys like the cottage industry, the taxi. Uh, and then he speaks about also the deposit uh, insurance uh, corporation. And then another interesting idea he spoke about is the investment audit corporation, uh, which I'll try to explain in detail shortly. Now, as far as the central bank is concerned, his idea is that it should be an autonomous uh, government institution. And we know that uh, like in certain developed countries, uh, the central bank is a private entity, but for him, he thinks that it should be related to the government. Why? Because it will achieve a bigger social economic, again, you see the word social economic comes here, uh, the social economic welfare uh, of the Ummah. And his second view is that the central bank in its function, it has to undertake a review of all the existing laws that are related to interest-based financial institutions. And I think really among many countries, we should give credit to Malaysia in the forefront. Uh, it has been trying as much as possible to make that transformation. And uh, we saw in the early days of Malaysia, even the definition of Islamic banking is not there, just so loosely. But now in 2013, you have IFSA, uh, which not only has the banking, but also has insurance and other. So this was something in Invisage earlier, which even did not exist. And you could imagine until only 2013, we were able to, uh, to put that things together. So he also had the idea of uh, that uh, the central bank playing the lender of last resort. Uh, and I think today we have standards. You can go to IFSB and uh, we can ask Prof. Rahim. He knows better about those. Uh, but I was involved with IFSB on the write-up of this lender of last resort. And of course, about also the deposit insurance. We have this standard with IFSB. Now, he also emphasized the supervisor, supervisory role. Uh, uh, which I think is being done now uh, with the central bank. And maybe during those days in the 80s, uh, that role could have been uh, you know, very minimal, uh, meager. Uh, uh, and maybe just in Malaysia, the Islamic banking has just kicked off uh, in 1983. <laughs> uh, and so over time, now we find uh, Sharia boards at the central bank uh, level. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, you know, reforms. Why supervision is important because the public needs to ensure safety for their, their deposits. Uh, there should be competition uh, uh, because with good supervision, you have a level playing field for all the, you know, the banks to compete and there are innovations. Uh, and uh, so these are very, very important things uh, about the supervision of banks and of course, efficiency also included. 
And then he also discussed about the pioneering role. And this is uh, really very important that the central bank should continue to play a pioneering role of Islamization uh, of the banking sector. And I think really we need a study on that to see uh, maybe we have a lot of our masters and PhD students and uh, I think uh, Professor Sam will be very happy to supervise those kind of uh, theses, uh, where really to see to what extent the central bank has been able to undertake Islamization of the banking sector. I think that could be a very interesting. And I would also advise Maybank to sponsor, since they are sponsoring book review. And I think that should be a risk appetite also for Maybank to look into that. Huh? Uh, have, and UIA is there to offer those uh, kind of expertise. Huh? for this research, which I think is very good. So as far as commercial bank is concerned, he says there must be a total abolition of interest. Um, really, I think this is a very tough question because I know there has been experience in Sudan. Uh, there has been experience in uh, uh, Pakistan. Uh, Iran also has tried uh, to Islamize the entire economy. Uh, but until today, you know, it's still uh, in, in, in limbo to a great extent because you have to do cross-border trading. Uh, our rules and regulations are still basically conventional. Uh, and uh, not only that, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of our asset size uh, to the total global uh, economy. Is, I mean, financial asset is still very small. Uh, and how are you going to short when you are just a small, you know, small rat there and the big players are there? So I think there are a lot of uh, issues here. But nonetheless, that attempt should continue, as he has said. Then he says also that um, uh, the use of funds must be based for maslaha and the welfare of the people. Uh, and I think Prof. Rahim has mentioned about the VBI. So I will add there has been a lot of also efforts on SDG impact investment. Uh, and then also we have the Maqasid al-Sharia, uh, which has been uh, put forward that uh, most of our banks should move towards that. And sincerely speaking, uh, we have seen me and Prof. Aslam could really testify that uh, banks have been allocating their CSR funds uh, towards helping, especially during the COVID-19. Uh, uh, we must really acknowledge that the banks have been very, uh, very, you know, coming forth uh, to help uh, the poor. Although I know the loan moratorium is still an issue, but let's put that aside. But we look at the other positive side uh, of what they have been uh, doing. And then he also talked about the equity orientation, uh, the equity, equity oriented. Uh, and I think, um, just let me give a very small, I don't know how many minutes I, I'm left with, but uh, let me give this small interesting story. Uh, when we see the equity base in our banking, uh, I think statistically less than 5%. Some people put it three, four, and the statistics differ. Um, and, and what are some of the reasons? Uh, and, and I believe uh, Prof. Rahim has mentioned some. But one I would like to add is what uh, uh, Dr. Sami Swailam, who is now the acting director of uh, uh, formerly called IRTI, now it's called IDB Institution. He talks about the absence of Islamic market. Uh, um, he says, if you want to sell orange, you will go to the orange market. Uh, if you want to sell fish, you go to the fish market. But what we have is our Islamic products we are selling in a conventional market. So for example, if uh, a customer comes to you and wants to you know, put money through Mubaraba account, then you tell the customer, you know, if there's profit, we share. So the customer laughs. And then you say, but if there is loss, uh, you take the loss because you're up on mile and we only lose our time. So I don't know how many customers uh, will be able to put money in that bank uh, because of that kind of a mindset. So the idea of Islamic market should also be looked into if we have to look at that uh, um, uh, progress. Finally, I would like to add the idea of uh, uh, investment audit uh, cooperation. Uh, that he has mentioned. And uh, I think it's a very good idea. So his idea is that uh, many banks today, um, their difficulty of uh, you know, uh, offering mudaraba, they'll say, we have to have so many staffs uh, to go and monitor because there's a lot of agency problem, huh? uh, adverse selection, et cetera. So you don't know whether people will declare their profit right or wrong. And costs are involved. And if you have to hire auditors, we need, you know, 
uh, these big auditors. So Chapra says to alleviate these concerns, we need to have this uh, uh, investment audit corporation, IAC, uh, which should be, you know, government, uh, you know, sponsored. And the cost should be borne by all the institutions who are offering this mudaraba or musharak. And the idea here is to help audit the banks, non-financial institutions, finances, investors, and all those who are concerned in mudaraba. And uh, so according to him, that when you have this committee, uh, the committee will go deeply into looking at the real profit, looking at all aspects of mudaraba, because you cannot rely on conventional auditors, according to him, who are basically not equipped to look at uh, this kind of a managerial frauds because they have certain specific, specific professionals, you know, they just look at the financial reports and, uh, and give their report and says, okay, okay. Uh, but here you have to go more deeper than the financial reports. So his idea of uh, investment audit corporation uh, becomes really uh, very handy. So to sum up, I will say, uh, based on those three assumptions that he put forward, all his reforms have also been supportive to enhance those assumptions, socioeconomic justice, uh, the issue of riba, and ultimately the equity-based kind of financing. And uh, so thank you if uh, my colleagues would like to chip in. Uh, I thank you very much again once to Jamal, Brother Jamal, sorry. Inshallah, you will be a doctor. You will be the first person to undertake that uh, Islamization uh, uh, master of PhD program. <laughs> <laughs> Inshallah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mustafa. And I think both you and uh, Professor Rahim did well to extract what was mentioned by uh, Uma Chapra in his book and then uh, give us the context in terms of uh, the narrative in terms of the supportive institutions in the, in the, and setting the landscape uh, to enable that transformation. Um, and I do know that uh, a big part of that is realizing the, the concept and idea propounded by Chopra to uh, enable the community to partake in the senior Raj uh, through profit, profit sharing. And this is something that uh, is long-standing and as you mentioned is part of the sunnah but this also uh requires furthermore than just institutional setting right uh we have the components we have uh the entities but it goes beyond just uh just a monetary system it is uh as you mentioned in islam a way of life so if i can come full circle and Put the last question to uh, Professor Aslam. In your thoughts, uh, uh, based on the book, what other elements are needed for us to move towards realizing the just banking and monetary system? Thank you, Jamal. Um, you know, before I answer that, I mean, I, I, I want to uh, bring us back to one, um, maybe a, a phrase that we didn't bring up in the session because uh, Omar Chapra, I, I think, didn't use this. Um, Omar Chapra talked about um, credit creation, talked about um, a system in which uh, debt is, you know, is, is, um, is uh, created and, and, and probably, um, you know, too much of it around. Um, after 50 years, you know, we, we have this term that we see in the last 10 years, financialization. And I, and I want to mention it because I think this is a very important um, um, you know, process that has been going on uh, globally. And it has also, in a way, um, uh, included Islamic banks because we are part of that global system, right? So when Chapra is talking about, um, you know, the, the, the role of, of, Islam, of conventional banks to actually promote lifestyles that, you know, that, that are considered to be, um, you know, luxurious and wastage and so on, um, you know, there are studies that talk about this financialization process that, that um, you know, connect financialization to an increase in many of the economic ills that we have. Uh, poverty, inequality, um, you talk about wage rates in, um, you know, in other than uh, in the financial sector yeah? uh, being, being, being uh, suppressed. Uh, people moving away from other 
manufacturing and and industrial um, sectors into the financial sector. So this financialization, um, you know, process, I think, is something that that we need to give attention to, especially how Islamic banks are um, either halting this process or are they also part of the process? I think this is something important. Although Chapra didn't mention it in the book, I think it's something worth uh, us looking at. Now, uh, you know, what else do we need to do? Um, I go back to my, you know, to my first point, and that was Chapra talked about multi-level reforms. Um, I think uh, Prof. Rahim mentioned yeah, he started with the individual, but there's also things that need to be done in society. So the society has got to be a society that does not, um, you know, somehow or other the values of society have got to be such that it's no longer, you know, uh, how, how many uh, houses you have or how many cars you have. You've got to change the value structure. So society has got a role to play, right? And the, at the national level, the government has got a role to play. At the international level, you have to have agency. So it's a multi-level reform agenda. It's also a multidisciplinary agenda, right? So as mentioned, we can't have banking reform without reforming the financial system. Um, you know, you cannot have uh, financial system reform without legal reform. And we see that from the Malaysian case, right? You, you, you can't talk about even establishing a bank without, uh, you know, in 1983, um, uh, reviewing the Islamic Banking Act, for example, right? So, so legal reforms have to be there. And, and what I've put in, in, in somewhere, I've tried to look at what people have been saying. You need political will. And this political will doesn't have to be only talking about, you know, the leader of the country, president or prime minister. Political will can also be at the level of the corporation, right? So, for example, Maybank, you know, Maybank Islamic has the political will to do certain things that you want to do, right? So, so this is what I mean by political will, right? Then you need the people. And, and Chapra, not maybe in this book as much as he has done in other, in other places, focuses on the role of education, you know, and the need to, to develop the, 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 the human resource that you need yeah, to, to, to be involved in the, the banking and finance and economic reforms. Uh, you know, Dr. Rahim is now the president of the International Council of Islamic Finance Educators, right? So, so we've been talking about, um, you know, about the need, you know, to, to, to uh, prepare yeah, the, the human resource that is needed. So you need people, right? And at the end of the day, you need the policies, right? And, 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 and if you put all the three together, I would actually say the people factor is the most important. Maybe a little biased, being in the academic uh, and education sector, we, we think that education is, you know, is, is very important. But I think it's, it's, it's shown by the writings of Chapra and many others that the long-term you know, the long-term goals are, are going to be achieved by people. And how do you create, you know, the people that you want? Education is a very, very important part of this, right? So, so I, I think Chapra, um, you know, talks about that individual reform that is needed. And although he doesn't mention it directly in this book, but I think, you know, he's talking about the role of education. Uh, and of course, good governance, I think it's also it's already mentioned by Dr. Mustafa, yeah, the importance of the role of the central bank, etc. Um, Chapra, you know, he became famous when one of our colleagues in his PhD thesis talked about the Chapra model. <laughs> and and uh, in, in a certain sense, um, yeah, it, it's in a way it's true because Chapra was one of those few who were quite vocal about, about his views on Islamic banks and so on. But you know, the, the, the amazing thing about Omar Chapra is that if you look at his writings since 85, right, as mentioned by Prof. Uh, Rahim, you know, he has, he has actually constantly been pushing the boundaries, okay? So from talking about a monetary system, he then discusses about socioeconomic justice in many of his other books and, and, and articles. And then he talks about connecting that to maqasid al-shari'ah, yeah, to give that, that, that 
basis in in, in Islamic Torah. Um, we need to develop according you know to these higher objectives of the Sharia. And then finally, he talks about how this can help to develop Islamic civilization. So he's always been pushing boundaries. And I, I really feel that the last 15 years with sustainable development agenda and more recently the sustainable development goals, it gives us a wonderful opportunity to actually you know, use some of these ideas. I mean, it's a golden opportunity um, you know, this famous phrase, in crisis, there's opportunity. So really, this, this provides an opportunity for us to show that Islamic banking, Islamic finance, Islamic economics is not just something in textbooks. Uh, even, <laughs> even that we don't have enough of, but, but it's not something that you just talk about in classes, but it has to be practiced. And maybe, you know, last point, uh, as mentioned by Prof. Rahim, value-based intermediation, right? This, uh, this Bank Nagara effort, uh, four years, it's about four years now, uh, I believe is, a, is a, in a way, it is a recognition of the views of Chapra and some of the other pioneer Islamic economists that banking has to go beyond, you know, the old model. We need, we need a new model. And that new model must be a model which goes beyond individual profit, all right? And, and I really believe that, you know, we in economics, I think we have to take a lot of the, you know, the blame for, for not giving that base yeah, to, to Islamic banking and finance. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I'm thinking about these ideas and I feel that if there is one thing that we need to do in economics in order to give the basis for VBI, is to relook at the theory of decision making. So I don't only think of my own self interest. All economic models that we study today are based on this rational economic man that wants to maximize his own self interest, right? We need to question this. We need to develop a new foundation. And I think Chapra talked about this, right? Uh, pioneers of Islamic economics talked about this. The goal of that decision maker is not only my own individual interest, but it, it also depends on the interests and well-being of others. So how do we develop a model in which all economic agents not only think of themselves, but somehow or other think about the well-being of others? Uh, this is something I think, you know, uh, maybe Chapra is not going to be held accountable for. I think he has already contributed his, his, his all. Yeah? It's, it's, I think, us and maybe the future generations, Dr. Gairu and, and colleagues, younger colleagues in IIUM, it's going to be your role yeah? to, to, to see how we can make sure that we take this opportunity um, you know, to really um, materialize what the pioneers said more than 50 years ago. Yeah? Wallahu ala. Thank you, Professor Aslam. I think you did well to kind of sum up uh, one of the more important things that Chapra has mentioned on top of everything that he has said. It is behavioral and it is uh, rooted in the person because at the end of the day, the person is the participant in the economy and the resources are ultimately allocated in accordance with the demands uh, of the market participants. So I think with that, we've covered the different hierarchies and had a good conversation in terms of covering uh, a breadth of uh, different concepts that was uh, proposed by Prof uh, Dr. Muhammad Umar Chapra in his book. Uh, so, with that, I think we are already at the end of uh, the panel session. Uh, I'd like to take this moment uh, to um, welcome any questions from the floor uh, with the assistance of Dr. Riyasat. Uh, with regards to the questions, if you have any, please feel free to type it into the chat box. Or alternatively, you could use the hand raise function and you, we could assist with unmuting your mic and you could uh, personally deliver your question to our three experts uh, today. Um, so while we um, 
Sang Alik Mark to light our cat, everyone. Um, so while we um, figure out uh, some of the verbal questions or while people prepare themselves, um, what I have been doing is uh, um, noting down some of the questions in the chat box. And I've um, listed them down in our common group. So speakers may engage with whichever of the questions I've put down. I've collected about um, 12 questions, uh, 11 or 12 questions so far. So we can serially address them um, one by one. Um, and um, uh, so I think maybe let's start with one or two verbal questions uh, directly. And um, if not, then we can proceed with some of the questions um, that I've already um, listed there. I think that would probably be a fair one. And also, if any of the speakers um, see the questions that we've listed, I think um, they can cherry pick according to what they believe is important as well. Okay. All right, we'll spare a moment uh, for anyone who would like to uh, verbally provide their questions. I think uh, Aznan has, has raised his hand. Could we have someone assist with the mic? You yeah, just need to unmute Aznan, the host. Yeah. Should be fine now. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you, uh, the panelists, uh, Prof. Aslam, uh, Prof. Muhammad Mustafa, and also Prof. Rahim. Thank you very much. Very good and uh, interesting discussion. Uh, I got two uh, reflections or two questions. I mean, we have several uh, discussions or rather debate with uh, Prof. Uh, Omar Chopra in many of the discussion. Uh, I mean, um, many of a closed door discussion. I remember we have discussion on on the use of tawaruk. Uh, we have discussion on equity base. We discussion about uh, the role of uh, monetary system and uh, central banks in uh, regulating Islamic banks differently from conventional bank due to the nature of uh, Islamic bank. In one of the discussion. Uh, uh, Prof. Omar raised the issue of equity-based uh, structure or equity-based financing the way that uh, the, the, the panelists have discussed today. One of the, uh, another economist, for example, uh, and his opinion then was supported by many scholars at times, state that uh, we cannot see uh, equity-based alone in Islamic bank. Because he ha we have to look at the nature of the financing itself. If someone comes to the Islamic bank asking for house financing, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, can, who is who is interrupting? Could you please uh, wait the turn? Sorry, Dr. Aznan. No problem. No problem. Uh, uh, it's so uh, one of the economies and, and then supported by other scholars, some uh, two or three scholars, I don't remember. Uh, he raised the issue that, look, we cannot just plainly say that equity base will be the only form of, uh, of contract to be used. For example, he said simply, if someone comes to an Islamic bank asking to buy house, it is very natural for us to do morabaha or at least ijarah on that particular house, not to do musharaka. Because the most suitable contract, perhaps, in that situation is Murabaha, not Musharaka anymore. Of course, when it comes to business, perhaps it will be more preferable for the banks to enter into equity base and to share the risk together with the client. So that was the second question. And then a and, and, and reflection on that, uh, Professor Omar made a very good remark. He said that, no, I never mean that everything has to be equity based. The problem that I have in Islamic Bank is that we never look at other contracts other than that base. That was my problem. Not, never ever I believe that uh, only the equity base should be the contract because 
when syariah allow other contract there must be a wisdom there must be wisdom reason for allowing other contracts whoever limiting themselves to only equity based not only they feel they fail to understand the wisdom of syariah they fail to understand the syariah the muamalat itself from syariah pun that the first question i need uh, some 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 reflection from the panelists on that the second one uh, dr rahim raised a very good issue on all the those what we call banks regulation coming in the basel tree with all the problem again even though ifsb should be more supporting of islamic finance in terms of providing the regulatory framework but yet is a uh, isb uh, most of the time conquer with whatever that has been said with basel and putting the framework in which equity based financing will become more and very much difficult it's not impossible for us to 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 practice in some day hence in that situation of course at that time there was no basel tree for that matter it was basel 1 or basel 2 still when we will have that discussion so he said perhaps the best way to implement islamic finance is not through banking perhaps the best way to practice islamic finance is not through banking because the way banking has been designed in this time is just about financial intermediary and islamic finance is about sharing the risk about sharing the business and everything and it is never meant for banking to do uh, islamic equity to do equity in that manner even If you look at if sa even the definition is islamic financial intermediaries not islamic other than that so what are the reflections from the speakers on that three two comments from omar chapra arising from that particular discussion thank you uh, jamal and the rest of the panelists very good discussion thank you very much thank you thank you dr asnan um so if i can just open uh, the option to the three panel members uh, whoever wants to uh, put forward their answers first um okay maybe i'll begin first uh, uh thank you very much uh, dr asnan uh, he knows in arabic they say rabbasail aw amil almasul Uh, the person asking the question actually has more answers than the person answering the question <laughs> yeah but uh, uh, i think you are you have raised uh, has been a long debate the issue of theory and practice hmm? now i think in theory uh, many would not really argue with what you have said even what chapra has said these are all things which uh, the sharia has uh, ordained and there are wisdom behind it and if you say murabah is not sharia then may allah save then you may be out of islam because these are things which uh, sharia has ordained if you say mudaraba or not you cannot do that but i think the, the critical issue comes to you know the practice when you look uh, whether it's uh, if you are applying mudaraba what's the real mudaraba or it's, uh, you know uh, what's the term the structured mudaraba uh, whether it's a real uh, buying and selling or it is financing in the form of buying and selling so i think this is where the issue comes so the second issue that will arise is how do you look at the maslaha when you look at the practice uh, if you have to look at the context of cost and benefit which i usually call as maslaha and mafsada analysis what would have a more you know bigger maslaha for the society if you rank all those instruments together bearing in mind that in theory you don't have to deny any of those but in practice i think we have to move forward and see which one would achieve a better maslaha given the current situation as it is we know that the debt system uh, because we are our hands are tied by the conventional rules and regulation uh, statistics say you have more high degree of indebtedness uh, look at the youth today uh, their debt in terms of the credit card in terms of car loan housing loan i mean we don't want to create a debt ridden society we want to create society of investors uh, when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam migrated from mecca to al madina um, i mean uh, subhanallah the, the sahaba were ready to give you know everything to their friends but they said no uh, show us where the market is they wanted to work so i think we need to look at it at the macro context if uh, uh, this thing is going to help our societies Uh, we still need the banking uh, like uh, bill gates says that we may not need banks but we need banking uh, so if we can transform the banking in a different way that can help achieve higher maslaha wallahi we are all for that and uh, and i think uh, my dear brother dr asnan he knows this very well 
and he has been in the market. He's a Sharia board member to many institutions. And um, uh, I share his concern and we are in the same boat. Thank you very much, Dr. Zana. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa, for that concise answer and uh, for shedding light uh, for the benefit of all the, uh, in attendance today as well. Um, is there uh, any other additional things that uh, Professor Aslam or Dr. Yeah, Rahim? Just, just let me a quick hmm. you know, addition to what Dr. Mustafa said. Uh, you know, I yeah. think uh, um, um, you know this idea of um, you know too much reliance on banks. I think it's it's a very valid point. Um, you know, in Anglo-Saxon countries in Malaysia as well, we follow you know uh, maybe a lot uh, of the British system. And in Britain, I, I always tell this in class, besides the few, you know, Christmas and a couple of other holidays, all their holidays, are, other holidays are bank holidays. Yeah? So, so it's a system, it's a system that is, that is built on the bank. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do think that maybe uh, there is a need for us to develop um, other, well, it can be different types of banks, right? So, so it can still be banks, but different kinds of banks. I see Professor Kabir there, and I'm sure he, maybe the American system is very different. And he, and you know, just to tell you all, it's maybe 3 a.m. now in the U.S. So thank you very much to to Prof Kabir for joining us. Um, you know, so you have you have these different types of institutions that probably, you know, could play a bigger role. Um, and and then you have the non-banking institutions. Um, and uh, Prof One is here. Prof One Mohtar is here, who is. Who is the chairman of uh, University of Bangsan Cooperative, yeah? Co Cooperative of University of Bangsan Cooperatives, you know, an incredibly, um, you know, uh, uh, institution that has great potential, but for a variety of reasons uh, has not been able to, you know, to gain the imagination of, of people. The banking industry is probably the most well regulated industry. And that is why probably people feel more comfortable with banks. But Shouldn't we be able to try and develop governance frameworks for these other types of institutions that can promote um, Islamic, um, you know, uh, practices? Um, I, I, I think that that should be something, you know, that we 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 start to do. And and I would really like to see, uh, you know, our our legal scholars, including our fixed scholars, sit down and you know come up with governance frameworks that that will actually be upgrading you know cooperatives and whatever other um, banking or non-banking financial institutions to come up to the mark where people are confident with those institutions i mean i think that that would be a wonderful thing for us to go down yeah Allah Allah. thank you uh professor aslam uh doctor uh, sorry professor rahim uh, would you would you like to weigh in as well uh First of all, let me thank uh, Dr. Aznan for raising up the issue. Uh, it is a relevant and very pertinent issue. And uh, I look at the uh, proposition made by uh, uh, Omar Chapra over the years. I think he has been very much more realistic than could be in 1980s, knowing that the shortcomings of the institutions, the system, as well as uh, other auxiliary institutions that are available in the Muslim societies, which that's why over, as I mentioned earlier in 1990s, somehow he uh, realized the five challenges facing Islamic banks. And one of the challenges that he mentioned is that, is that the issue of there is no need to standardize to one or two types of uh, financing structure, but instead it should be more open. But the problem that we need to address the imbalances of the type of financing that we offer to, to, to people. There is a lack of balance in terms of uh, more towards debt too much compared to the equity side. That need to be addressed. And to address that, I think uh, Omar Chapra did also mention a number of things as well. The, in order for you to do that, Islamic Bank itself might expand their role beyond commercial banking, which I mentioned earlier, universal banking, or perhaps as Dr. Azna mentioned, it may not be through banking, be possibly in the future. But again, there must be a network of other auxiliary institutions to support the establishment or the development of some equity-based financing. But I have to reiterate, uh, you look at the economic impact of Islamic equity-based financing, be it Mudaraba or Musharaka, 
the impact to society is actually more direct uh, compared to, of course, debt. Debt is actually you are creating. Uh, one thing is a burden to customer, but at the same time, yes, it is legally uh, acceptable, uh, sharia-wise, depending on the types, like some rabha and so on. But we need to address the imbalances. And uh, the imbalances, uh, I think, should not be imposed only to Islamic banks to address. The central bank needs to address. In fact, the demand of the society should be should, should be geared towards more uh, equity-based. But we need, to, again, Dr. Prasla mentioned about education and the reform of individuals as well. That could be uh, the way forward as well. Instead of putting too much burden on Islamic bank, we need more concerted effort from central bank to the people, to the bankers, of course, and of course, future generations should take up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Rahim. Um, okay, uh, I think we have to uh, just move along uh, to the next question. If I can just provide an opportunity to the next person who raised their hand, which is... Uh, Professor Khadir, I think. Yes. Uh, I think your mic is already unmuted. And uh, whenever you're ready. Yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. It's good to see you, my friends. Professor Aslam, Mustafa and Abdul Rahim. And actually, I uh, started uh, from the very beginning, so I listened very carefully to all of the arguments that you made in the famous book towards Islamic monetary reform by Professor Omar Chapra, is a very dear to us. You know, there are many issues. Just let me start with this uh, COVID-19. Do you know, in order to tackle this COVID-19, every government has come up with a set of roles a set of policies and prescriptions, and more or like based on conventional system. Do you know the amount of money that has been created? One of the points that Professor Aslam mentioned, financialization, there were 76 trillion that was created out of this system. And out of the 70 trillion, 70 trillion went to the developed countries. <laughs> Four trillion went to emerging economies, and only two trillion went to OIC member countries. Now the question is, one of the cracks of Islamic monetary system of justice, you know, you have to understand our Professor Sallam came up with a social agenda. He did not really specifically talk about Islamic banking, you know, those type of concept. And actually in the Quran, the, there is a ayah about riba, but nowhere in the Quran, Allah said, give me a bank. So the banking was our human invention. Unfortunately, that we have started with the wrong footing when our forefathers started with this experiment. We started with this cooperative banking system, you know, and the Najjar learned from in Germany. But ultimately, because of this colonial system, we inherited that in the conventional banking system, because we want to bring riba free economy. So it started with something, doctrine of necessity. We started with conventional banking model. And that is the intermediate that Prof. Aznan was mentioning, that a bank cannot do more than what it is doing right now. Unless you change the banking model itself, that is consistent with the spirit of Islamic finance, the risk sharing finance. So instead of, you know, talking bad about banking completely, you know, let uh, the banks do what they do the best, okay, within the context. And I think I would say that Malaysian government has done a good job bringing the value-based intermediation. That as Professor Aslam said, individual profit is more than that. So let's try to bring something better, whatever system that we inherit, unless the main problem, and many of us, I wish I would see our brother Dina Standard, I forgot his name, um, you know. Kamil, Kamil. Yeah. Um, and we talked about that movement, you know, 1990s, you know, started with the DINA standard. So in order to monitor reform internationally, that's a big game. One of the big game I'm saying that, you know, as you said, uh, Professor Mustafa said that, you know, it's, it's an uh, unequal earned income and exploitation. Professor Aslam said that too. That is the cracks of this conventional banking system. Now, if you want to change it, the whole Western banking system is based on this principle, regardless of whatever they say. And if you read the monetary history of the United States, one of the president was even killed, the Abraham Lincoln. You know, if you read the history of the second central bank, you know, when there is a civil war and 
he wanted to borrow money directly or create money directly to benefit the economy. He wanted to bypass the banking system. The banking system got together and get rid of him. Because why do you have to go to a bank in order to borrow money? Why the government can borrow money directly, then create money? So, and you know, those who study deep uh, macroeconomic theory, money is a new matter. It does not exist in general equilibrium. But if you look at the any economy, even in Malaysia, that in total GDP, 40% on the roughly of total GDP is contribute the banking system or financial system. How is it possible? It is supposed to be, a, you know, a Greece, but the Greece is taking over the financialization. We really need to look at this thing. Now the question is, and I must thank us, uh, honey, Mustafa. Yalan, you know. yalan. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, please ensure that uh, your mic is muted if you're not um, un uh, asking questions. Sorry, Professor, uh, no. where you, you would yeah. continue. That's what I'm saying that, let's say one of these things that I must, as a complaint to both brothers here, uh, first of all, I want to thank you that you did not sell your soul because you had not been lived away from an institution by other institutions in Malaysia. But at the same time, I have a complaint against you. Let's say today there is an Islamic government or the, there is a next government is more geared towards Islamic. And they want someone, one of you, come, Brother Hani, Brother Mustafa, I want to run this monetary system right now. Give me some practical tools. Unfortunately, the point that Aslam has referring to, ultimately people, education, that the skill set in your curriculum is missing. They really need to know the tools, how to run the monetary mechanism. It's not all what we are doing, creating all this, you know, uh, preaching type of thing. You know, we said this, said this, you know, any sort of, uh, you know, um, um, discourse you go into, you know, the speaker will start with two ayat from the Quran, three ayat from the Hadith, and then stop. But I need to know if I'm put in this place, how would I run this monetary mechanism within the country and uh, against uh, the rest of the world? So what in, in gist I want to say, let a bank be a bank, try to make it more Islamic, unless the time when we can get rid of the fractional reserve banking system. That's number one. Number two, educate this new brand of scholars who will be the Sharia based, but also know the modern tools and how to run, how a monetary system mechanism works. You know, they have to be good with computers, numbers, theory, and ideas. And unfortunately, I must say, neither IUM or any other institution that I know have been able to create that, that new cadre of, uh, of uh, uh, scholars that will be able to take over the economy. And finally, uh, we have to cognizant the fact that you know, the change happens slowly, slowly. And that's what actually one of these um, uh, prescription of Omar Chopra as well. We have to start a little thing and little thing will start building up. So why don't you start with education that you can do? And I think IIUM has created the entire banking, Islamic banking industry in, in, the, in Malaysia. Everywhere I go and talk to has a degree, either bachelor's degree or master's degree, so let's take the IIUM, take this lead again. And I must say, the NCF will not be able to do that. I am saying publicly, you better take over this role again. And may Allah bless you. Thank you. I'm sorry I took much time. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Prof. Kabir, for, for, for your... Yeah, he's always, he's always blunt. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. <laughs> Thank you uh, for your thoughts and questions, and and perhaps like just to add on, uh, Professor Aslam, if you have anything to to mention or no, no, I I, I agree with everything he said. Um, you know, we have to get our house in order. We have to make sure that our students and I think even our staff have all the tools that are necessary. Yeah, I think many of our academic staff also. Uh, lack uh, knowledge of the practice. And I put myself in that as well. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have much knowledge about how banks run and, you know, how things are. So that bridge has to be, has to be, you know, built between the two. And, and, and that I think is also what ICF is supposed to be doing. So again, Dr. Rahim, <laughs> you know, your, your job as well. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, try to pro for trying to provoke me. Um, 
I, I do agree. I, I, uh, I actually echo the sentiments uh, by Prof. Kabil just now. Perhaps we should start with education. But having said that, I think um, we should look at from comprehensive uh, reform as much as possible. I think if we read the book written by Prof. Machapra, he, he mentioned uh, a pre very comprehensive economic reform. Education, for sure, individuals, then institutions, and even Islamic bank, Islamization of the uh, economic system as well, central banks, and so on and so forth. So it needs to be gradual, I agree. It needs to be comprehensive, I also agree. And moving forward, education is one, definitely. Uh, but again, we need to address all issues. Uh, we cannot say that, okay, Islamic bank do have to bother about uh, equity financing or social justice, focus on profit. I think that is also uh, being unfair. Uh, after so many years, after 30 years actually in Malaysia, it's about time for Islamic Bank to do soul searching as well. Perhaps value-based intermediation is, could be a starting point for SD to uh, increase a little bit more contribution of Islamic equity-based financing, could be. But beyond that, uh, the issue of prosperity, uh, makasid sharia and so on and so forth, should be at the forefront of the government policies as well. So that, I think, should be taken up by responsible institutions such as Bank Negara and so on. Uh, I don't want to comment about universities, uh, comparison about universities, as mentioned by Prof. Kabir, but all have their own contributions to play. Thank you. Thank you. Um, without further ado, let's just uh, quickly hop on to the next question from the chat. Uh, we have an interesting question from Professor Wan Mukta uh, towards any of uh, the three panelists. Can instruments of zakat wakaf be extended based on Islamic-based market system? What are some of the ideals of Chapra on an alternative banking system without conventional banks, perhaps in relation to cooperative institution roles? I think this was uh, addressed uh, in part uh, earlier on, but perhaps uh, either one of the three, uh, Professor Aslam, uh, or Professor Rahim, uh, if you want to just uh, quickly mention again. Prof Rahim, you want to take it or? No, oh, I pass it to Prof Mustafa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Rahim. You see, uh, I think following what uh, Prof uh, Kabir has just said, I think it was something important he mentioned about a parallel uh, system. If you look at zakah and waqaf since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu this is called the third sector. You had the private sector, you had the public sector, and then you had the third sector, uh, which is a community-based, society-based. Uh, so to me, if you will uh, tap on this waqaf and zakah while preserving their features, uh, meaning don't distort their features, uh, they can contribute uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, development of the community, development in the public sector, development in the private sector. That is good. Huh? Uh, but to take them as part of the private sector, part of the public sector, I think will be uh, counterproductive. And we have seen this already happening. A lot of studies show that uh, the trust deficit level uh, among people, even for paying zakat, zakat compliance has been very high when these institutions are not run independent of their features. Huh? So I would think that you need good uh, zakat and work of governance. And I think our brothers in Indonesia have come up with core principles on, on this work of and zakat. And also we have IOF standards, even in Malaysia, they have standards. Uh, and other parts of the world. So I think um, my, my view is that this institution should be left independent. And uh, those institutional investors who want to help Zaka and Wakaf grow, they are welcome. Uh, they can share their, uh, their profits with uh, Zaka institution or Wakaf institution, uh, particularly Wakaf, uh, so that both can grow together. So I would still think it's part of the third sector. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, I'm just looking at the time now. Uh, perhaps we have a moment for one or two more questions. Uh, the next one, uh, we have a question from Faisal to all the panelists. Uh, he asked that, do you think people resort to a more unjust monetary system because of the pandemic? 
And how would an Islamic economy manage this sort of situation? I'd like to open this to uh, any of the panelists. Uh, whenever, if you have any, uh, feel feel free to address. Maybe uh, Professor Aslam, if you have any ideas, you mentioned about the behavior. So this is uh, linking to that behavior, per perhaps under duress. Well, I mean, you know, if, if the question is talking about people taking advantage during these uh, trying times, you know, to, um, you know, to um, really exploit those who, who are in need and who are vulnerable, um, I think this is where, as mentioned by Dr. Mustafa, uh, not only the third sector, but certainly the government has to, to come in, right? Uh, as we don't have, you know, the individuals that, that, you know, that we want to create at the moment. So certainly the, the, the government has to play a role. And that's why, as mentioned by Prof. Kabir, you know, there's been tremendous, uh, you know, packages of, of debt that have been created, um, not only uh, nationally, but even internationally. Um, the point is, how did, you know, 90% of that go to developed countries and not to to developing countries. I mean, that, that's a major issue. So, so um, that's one issue about, about the creation of uh, a more unjust system. Um, but I think there is a great potential for, for the third sector to play a role. And, and I think we see it also in Malaysia and I'm sure in other countries where, you know, on the one hand, you may have, um, you know, stories about, um, yeah, you know, some um, people taking advantage but you also see a lot of uh, goodwill and 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 uh, you know uh, voluntary um, um, work and activities happening and and that i think is the positive side of things i would just like to take it one you know one step higher and see how we could actually institutionalize some of these third sector um, you know um, um, uh, activities you know simple thing you you want to help smes um, is it possible for us to uh, have, uh, let's say, sukuk being being uh, being issued, uh, but offered to corporations and to those who are in the higher income brackets, you know, retail sukuk. So you don't have to bring the government in. The money is from corporations or from individuals who are high net worth individuals. Government just persuade them to take up the sukuk papers. So. You, you, you help the SMEs and hopefully there is a profit there somewhere for you. Um, this could be one way to, you know, so uh, I don't know if I answered that, but that's just some of the ideas that maybe come to me. All right. Thank you. I think um, on that uh, note, uh, can, yes, can Dr. I, Dr. I Mustafa. Yeah, I just would like to take two minutes. You see, we go back to history uh, among our caliphs, the four caliphs, no Khalifa was tested like Sayyidina Omar uh, anhu. During his time, there were calamities uh, like we have here now, our COVID. <laughs> he had that calamities and many people died. He also was tested with famine. He was tested with earthquake. The economy was so bad that uh, people were hardly had nothing you know, to eat. And some people reported in Egypt going to the extreme of eating things which are not even uh, supposed to be eaten. And so what Sayyidina Omar did was, uh, look at the difference. He called all his judges and says, from today, we are not cutting the hand of anybody. Hmm? We are suspending this rule uh, until Omar brings back the economy on its foot. Uh, because people are stealing, not because they are thieves. They're stealing because of needs. Hmm? Uh, they have no choice. In other words, the message is, Omar says, uh, it is because of my failure that people are, are stealing. So I have to bring the economy to that. Uh, it means um, if this uh, so-called barura is caused by our failure, the failure of the rich, uh, the failure of our system, the failure of our states, the failure of uh, you know our politics, the failure of this, and people are stealing, then this becomes everybody is now under you know barura. They are not stealing because they want to steal, but they are forced because of. Uh, the circumstance. Huh? And so when Sayyidina Omar restored the economy, he brought back the law. So, but of course, there is something called, sometimes people just speak darura, darura. 
But there's another thing tied to darura. It says, a darura to qaddar bi qadriha. That means darura has to have a limit. And when you are using darura, deep inside you, you should feel guilty. You are crying to Allah that, Ya Rabb, you know I'm somebody who is very you know, morally upright. Allah, you know this is haram what I'm doing. Allah, you know this is, you know, you speak to yourself, you detest whatever you are doing. And if you do that, then Allah says, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَ اللَّهُ مَخْرَجَ Allah will listen to your concern and open the way for you out of that darura. But if you are saying, darura, darura, makan apa ni, nasi goreng, darura, ayam goreng pun, darura, everything also darura, then I think that's not, uh, not darura. So darura, we have to feel it. But at the end of the day, uh, how much have we done to help uh, the poor in the system? Just like uh, Prof. Kabir is saying, uh, the financialization of all those trillions, uh, where it went, uh, does it help on our people? So I think that is where the, the darura comes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mustafa. And on that note, um, we've come... Jamal, Jamal. Yes. Can I, can I just... You know, I, I'm sorry, just maybe I, there is a question addressed to me. Okay. Please just address it very quickly. And Yes, sure, sure. Something about the JAK and not the Kutu Bank. I, I don't know these banks, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. But the issue is they don't create credit in the system. So I'm assuming there's no credit creation. So what can IBs do? Now, in the, in the literature written by, by different scholars, besides the, the banks that, you know, create credit, uh, you have two ideas. One is the gold dinar idea, which, which you know, maybe is not part of this discussion today. And the other one is actually a 100% reserve requirement and, and where the, the state comes in to allocate these resources in a certain way. And I do believe there's been some serious work done in this area, but you know, I, 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 I'm not too sure whether that's a viable thing, but I'm just saying that that could be one way written in the literature. Very quickly on Muhammad Nazimuddin's, uh, you know, discussion, how do we get political buy-ins? You know, uh, it's very interesting in one of his later works, uh, Chapra argues that in today's world, any Muslim government that wants to get elected must understand that the people want Islam. And therefore, you already immediately have a, a, a plus factor for you. Right, you 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 want to get to become you know president, prime minister, whatever. You need to address the demand for Islam and Islamic economics and Islamic banking. So we've got we've got that situation, and and we need to make sure that we don't bungle it up by you know you know doing things that 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 give it a bad name. So we have we have a responsibility to make sure. That whatever reforms we do in the name of Islamic reform, bank economics and banking, they do bring the well-being of people, as Chapra says, yeah, that it's better taken care of in our reforms. And once that happens, you get you get the the proof. Yeah. So really, um, you know, I think um, um, it's it's uh, you know corporations like Maybank and other Islamic banks that that assist you. To buy to get that political buy-in. Wallahu a'lam. Thank you, Professor Aslam. Um, I think we've arrived uh, beyond time, uh, but I think it is well worth it because we've covered uh, most of the important questions, and I think we've really spent a, a good amount of it uh, going through and peeling back uh, the ideas of Chapra in his book, but also interrelation uh, with the current times and given the COVID pandemic and everything, uh, it is very timely that we have this discussion. On that note, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the three expert panel speakers for uh, participating this evening. Um, thank you so much for sharing us your views, uh, your thoughts and experience in terms of uh, a just monetary system. Uh, I'd like to also uh, give a warm thanks to Dr. Muhammad Rafiq Merikan, CEO of Maybank uh, Group Islamic Banking, to Professor Dr. Gairu Zazmi, Madgani, Dean Kulia of Economics and Management Sciences, International Islamic University of Malaysia, to Dr. Zulkafli Abbas, Chairman of Maybank Islamic Berhad, as well as to Dr. Aznan Hassan.
Chairman of Sharia Committee, Maybank Islamic Berhad. And finally, I'd like to thank all the attendees and audience members uh, who joined us today. Uh, I hope everyone had a, a very insightful and, and a wealth of uh, knowledge coming from this discussion. And we can walk away on this Friday, on this blessed uh, day with uh, more ilmu and Inshallah, as we move forward, we will be able to realize and uh, bring fruit to all the research that has been done by contemporaries such as uh, Professor Dr. Uma, Muhammad Uma Jafra. And with that, I'd like to bid you thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And over to you, Dr. Nizam. Thank you very much, Mr. Jama Arif Jamaluddin, for the excellent moderating. And also uh, special thanks to our distinguished uh, speakers uh, and also all the participants from all over the world, including from as far as the United States, to be able to join us in this uh, webinar event. Uh, and uh, our sincere appreciation lies with uh, Maybank Islamic Berhad for this uh, collaboration between academia and the industry. And uh, we hope that this uh, collaboration uh, will be strengthened in the future so that uh, all the ideals and goals of Islamic economic system uh, trying to realize socio-economic justice uh, can be strengthened and facilitated through the political will, not only by the government, but also by uh, corporate leaders such as uh, Maybank Islamic. Uh, and uh, the fact that uh, Maybank Islamic has uh, awarded uh, us with this uh, project, uh, showed how uh, sincere and highly committed uh, they are in building the bridge between academia and the industry. And uh, we look forward to our future webinar event, uh, probably early next year, and we will keep you all posted uh, about the uh, information later on. Thank you again. I uh, hope you have uh, had a good and fruitful discussion and hopefully uh, all the points that we have uh, heard from the panelists as well as the commentators during the question and answer session uh, can be taken up, especially in terms of the practicalities, uh, what uh, needs to be done to bring forward the transformation towards a just monetary and banking system. Thank you again to all of you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, good to see you, Nizam. I just a flashback from memory. While you're doing your PhD at Durham University, we had lunch at Kingston. You remember me? Yes, Bahra? Prof. Yes. Okay, yes, good prof. to see you again. Yeah, yeah. see you. Inshallah. Blessed Friday, bringing together old, old uh, friends. <laughs> Assalamualaikum. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Assalamualaikum. Let's be a... <laughs> Four a.m. <laughs> okay. It's four o'clock in the morning. Okay. Yeah. Salam alaikum. Salam. You can Salam. you can go for tahajjud, uh, Prof. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's pray for each other. Okay. Yeah. Salam alaikum. Allah, Prof. Salam. Salam. It's a good session, Jamal. I think you handled it very well. And yeah, yeah. alhamdulillah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much, Doctor.